You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Our sin is forgiven, and from that point forward, we are identified with him so closely that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, he sees Jesus, which is glorious because I know me. I don't like what I see, but the fact that Jesus is standing there in front of me and he's seeing me through Jesus just makes it all worthwhile. He was smitten and crushed for us. He took the penalty for our sin and he nailed it on the cross with him. He just did because he loves us. As Pastor Ken continues his teaching series through the book of Ezekiel, he'll be reminding you that as a Christian, all your past, present, and even future sins have been forgiven. Don't allow the enemy to cause you to isolate and grow bitter simply because you've fallen. For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous. No, no, not one. The Bible says, when you sin, confess your sin to the Lord and he'll be faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 7, as he continues his message, It's the End of the World as We Know It. Sin has a tendency of producing a result that cannot be hidden. You know, I I always get a kick out of it. We think we can get away with something, and it's a secret sin, but in heaven it's open scandal. They know about it. And God's going to ensure that People will know about it here, too. It's just that kind of, kind of a thing. That's what God's telling the nation through Ezekiel. They're saying, if you sin, you're going to be found out about it. You think you've gotten away with this, nobody knows, everyone's going to know. Uh, and we're going to find out how Ezekiel, when he's taken to the temple and shown what's going on there, God is basically saying, here's all the secrets, here's all the secret sin. I'm showing you what I see and now you're going to tell everybody about it. So all of a sudden the secret's out, and and we now know that what was being talked about by Jeremiah and being talked about in 2 Chronicles in regards to what was happening in the temple, Ezekiel will tell us about that uh, when we get to chapter 8. Verse 5 of chapter 7. Thus says the Lord God, a disaster, a unique disaster. Behold, it's coming. An end is coming. The end has come. It has awakened against you. Behold, it has come. This is a great sermon that he's teaching here. Your doom has come to you, O inhabitant of the land. The time has come. The day is near. Tumult rather than joyful shouting on the mountains. Now I will shortly pour out my wrath on you and spend my anger against you. Judge you according to your ways and bring on you all your abominations. My eye will show no pity nor will I spare. I will repay you according to your ways while your abominations are in your midst. Then you will know that I, the Lord, do the smiting. What we see right there in that last verse is a new name of God. Uh, God has a lot of different names. But in Ezekiel 7, we see a new name. And that new name is is God the smiter. In Scripture, we get introduced to a whole bunch of different names for God. In Genesis twenty-two fourteen, we see that he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Okay? In Exodus 17, 15, he's Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner or our covering, the one who protects us. In Judges 6, 24, we see he is Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, the Lord of peace. In Jeremiah 23, 6, we see he is Jehovah Tadiskanu, the Lord our righteousness. And I like those names. I mean, we all can identify with those names, right? Oh, I like that. I like the God that does that. But now we find out that he is Jehovah Maka, uh, the Lord who smites, the Lord who whips, the Lord who, who judges. Uh, because God is not only a provider, he has to judge sin. And the problem is, is that when we come to the Lord, we get the whole picture. We get those nice things, but he also judges sin. And his standard hasn't changed. We keep trying to change his standard. You know, we call it white lies. It's a lie. It's not a white lie. Uh, Politicians will say misspoke. It's still a lie. Or we'll spin it this way. It's still a lie. It doesn't matter. 
it, it doesn't matter. We, we try to excuse things by making it lo- not look so evil, not look so bad anymore. But God just says, here's the standard. I haven't changed my mind. It's still the standard. Um, but there's good news for the fact that we have a God who is also known as God the judger, God the smiter. And that is Jesus Christ took that penalty for us. He took the smiting for us. We don't have to worry about that because Jesus took that upon himself. In Isaiah 53, verses 10 to 12, we see this. The Lord was pleased to crush him. That word there is maka, smite him. Putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for transgressors. God is the God who smites, but Jesus took care of that for us. We don't have to worry about that. When we give our life to Jesus Christ, our sin is forgiven, and from that point forward, we are identified with him so closely that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, he sees Jesus, which is glorious because I know me. I don't like what I see, but the fact that Jesus is standing there in front of me and he's seeing me through Jesus just makes it all worthwhile. He was smitten and crushed for us. He took the penalty for our sin, and he nailed it on the cross with him. He just did because he loves us. He loved us so much that he wanted us to spend eternity with him. And that's why he did that. Uh, It wasn't the nails that held him on the cross. It was his love for you and for me that held him on that cross. What we see with Israel is the natural result of sin. The natural result includes the crushing, the smiting, the the being judged for, for for having committed it. God does not wink at sin. Still doesn't. He judges it. And we see that here in Ezekiel. In verse 7 and 10 uh, here of chapter 7, in the King James Version, there's a phrase used called the morning has come, uh, or it's called the doom has come. Here here in the New American Standard it says your doom has come. But the Hebrew word means to plate or to braid. And it's interesting, how do you get a word that means to braid hair to mean doom? I don't, anyway. Uh, and in Isaiah 28, 5, it's actually translated diadem. So how do you get mourning or doom out of this word? Um, it's probably from the image of that which comes around. For a braided garland is the result of weaving flowers into a circle. Mourning comes around day after day, and the doom of the Israelites had come around. I don't know if that's exactly what they were thinking. It's just I see the same word, and I'm going like, how do you get that from that? But that's what they got. They had woven their own shameful crown of sin when they could have worn a diadem of glory of the Lord. So if you look at it from the viewpoint that your doom has come, it's your doom of your own doing, of your own braiding. You've actually put it together piece by piece slowly, and it's your doom. It's nobody else's. You're the one that put it together. So God is drawing a picture using Ezekiel for everyone who's listening. He wants his listeners to know exactly what is going to take place in about three years. He, he wants them to understand this is going to happen. And he's going to draw four pictures for them, four very clear pictures that they can understand and see. The first picture starts in verse 10. Behold the day. Behold, it's coming. Your doom has gone forth. The rod has budded. Arrogance has blossomed. He's giving a picture of flowers blooming, but he's comparing it to doom. Violence has grown into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain. None of their people, none of their wealth, nor anything imminent among them. The picture that God uses first is that of a rod that buds. And if you're listening, the first thing you think of when you hear, oh, the rod that budded, that's in number 16. There was a rebellion involving Korah and Korah thought he was better than Aaron and he should be high priest and all the people with him should be high priest. And God said, no, I've selected Aaron and to prove it, I'll have Aaron's rod, I'll have the person who's 
the priest, his rod will, will bud. So they all had these rods. They laid them on the ground. And the next morning, Aaron's rod had flowers and ripe almonds on it. It was a, a rod, dead rod. So these folks are going to see that. They, they think of that immediately as they hear this language that uh, the violence has grown into a rod of wickedness. Now it's not a rod that Aaron's using. Now it's a, it's a total different picture. Now, with Korah's rebellion, thousands died. 14,000, I think is what it says in Numbers, uh, died due to their grumbling and discontent with the way that God was doing things. The Levitical rebellion was caused by pride and jealousy, and God showed up by having Aaron's rod bud and have ripe almonds on it. So by doing that, God showed that Aaron was indeed the chosen of God, and the priesthood belonged with him. Now, it also showed that as Aaron's ministry was ripe, so was God's judgment on those who rebelled. Their judgment was ripe. So as Aaron is serving and ministering, the judgment on those who complained is ripe, and they were judged. This picture is not lost on Ezekiel's hearers. Remember, Ezekiel is a priest. He knows what some of this stuff means, and some of the people there are also priests, and they're going to know what it means too. He's a Levite of the priestly class, and this is one of uh, imagery of ripeness for judgment. So literally, God had been long-suffering as his people disobeyed the law and defied the prophets. And now their sin has ripened. In other words, you reap and you sow. He's using that imagery, and it's time for them to reap what they have sown. So in their pride, they had cultivated false confidence that the Lord would never allow his people to be exiled. And they still believe that. You know, 10,000 people sitting in Nippur, south of Babylon, God will never let us be exiled. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, where are you living? Uh, in Babylon. Yeah, good talking to you. Uh, yeah, the, but the sin of the nation has now matured. Um, and just as Moses had warned the tribes to the east of the Jordan, Ezekiel's warning everybody around him. And they're already in exile, but he's warning that their sin, as well as the continuing sin of everybody back home, uh, it's time for judgment to fall, and it, it can't be avoided anymore. The judgment is now ripe. So that's the first picture. The second picture is in verses 12 and 13. The time has come. The day has arrived. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is against all their multitude. Indeed, the seller will not regain what he sold as long as they both live, for the vision regarding all their multitude will not be averted nor will any of them maintain his life by his iniquity. So if agricultural images don't do it for you, how about business? Let's talk about real estate. That's what he's doing. He says, okay, these are for the agricultural guys. Now we're going to go into the business world for those who are business oriented. So we'll give you a business picture. Uh, and he also brings in as part of that the sabbatical year and the jubilee year because if you understand the way business was supposed to be done under the law, then you would understand some of the language the, that he's using here. So let's cover a little bit of that. In Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 to 6, we get some information in regards to the way business was supposed to take place in the nation. It didn't most of the time. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a remission of debt. So every seven years, all the debt was supposed to be forgiven. Okay? Uh, this is the manner of remission. Every creditor shall release what he's loaned to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor and his brother because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. From a foreigner you may exact it, but your hand shall release whatever of yours is with your brother. However, there will be no poor among you since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess it if only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all this commandment which I'm commanding you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he promised you. And you'll lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. And you will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. Well, they didn't obey, they didn't follow, and as a result things didn't turn out the way they should. But every seven years there was supposed to be a sabbatical year. And after every seven sabbatical years, so every 50 years, on the 50th year you'd have You'd have seven sabbatical years, year 49, then year 50 was a jubilee year. Even more things would take place. The problem is the nation had a problem with the jubilee year too. Not only did they not re uh, take care of the debt problem and release the slaves and do everything they were supposed to do with the sabbatical years, but they didn't do it for the jubilee year either. 
Um, so it says in 2 Chronicles 36, 20 and 21, those who had escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. They had not obeyed the Sabbath year. All the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. 70 times 7, they had not done the Sabbath in 490 years at all. That starts with David. Goes all the way to this time period. 490 years. There are going to be those in the nation who would see the coming of Babylon and would be listening to the false prophets and by the way, are also going to look at this and say, hey, I can make a quick buck because the false prophets are telling me that we're going to come back in the land, we're going to be fine. So there are going to be people who are going to see this army coming and they're going to want to sell and they're going to want to sell the land cheap. I'm going to turn around and buy it and then I'll sell it and make a big profit. So you got profiteering going on. War profiteering. And Ezekiel points out that those guys who want to do that, they're not going to be able to enjoy it. They're not going to be able to sell it. And they're never going to be able to redeem it. Because they're going to be dead. It's, uh, he told the captives, literally, enjoy yourself. You're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. That's in Jeremiah 29 10. You're going to spend your sabbatical years there and the next year of Jubilee in captivity if you're alive. The vision of coming judgment would not be reversed. Instead, the entire economic pattern is being reversed. So they were supposed to be doing business a specific way with remission of debt and all of that taking place after several years. And every 50 years, they were supposed to be having a year of jubilee. The land was supposed to rest. It was, and they had little tricks that they did to get around it. Uh, they still do it today. Um, a Jew cannot operate the field, so they'd sell it for a shekel to a Gentile so he could operate it for the next, uh, next year. And then they'll buy it back for a shekel. That's not what the Bible says. They would continue to use it. Uh, but that's one of the tricks that they would use to try and get around what the Scripture says. And as a, as a result, God says, you didn't follow the law. You didn't follow the opportunity for the sabbatical year to take place. Slaves were supposed to be set free every seven years. Ezekiel 21, Exodus 21, 2, rather, clearly says that. But for that to happen, you have to follow the law. They didn't. As a result, they had a slave class in Israel now. And these were people who were Jews. These were not folks who had willingly become a slave. Those are called doulos, where they were bond slaves. They allowed themselves to do that because they loved the house. These are folks who just weren't ever going to be set free. They were now slaves. So you had poor and you had a slave class, even though God said, if you obey me, that'll never happen. So as a result, because they wouldn't release the slaves, God's going to take them and make them slaves. It may seem fair to God. It seems fair to me. You know, you don't want to release the slaves? Fine, you're a slave. And that's how God take, took care of it. The land, well, you know, you want to buy the land? It never belonged to you in the first place. It, remember, it always belonged to God, but uh, now it's going to belong to Nebuchadnezzar. The people forgot about that too. Now they don't own the land anymore either. It belongs to Nebuchadnezzar. So then we come to verse 14, which is a, another picture being drawn for them. They've blown the trumpet and made everything ready. But no one's going to battle. For my wrath is against all their multitude. The sword's outside and the plague and the famine are within. He who's in the field will die by the sword. Famine and the plague will also consume those in the city. So we have a picture now of the perspective of the watchman. Every town has a watchman. It's a guy, a class of folks who are hired. And their job is to be on the tower. And their tower is all around the city. And they're to be looking constantly, and if an army sh shows up, they sound the alarm. If there's somebody approaching, they sound the alarm. That's their job, to sound the alarm. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, so, I mean, if you want to give a, a modern picture of it, it would be a radar operator sitting in a dark room, staring down, making sure that nothing's going to approach. They sound the alarm uh, if, if something approaches. That's what they're supposed to do. Cities would post these individuals on the wall, and, and literally, if they did not sound the alarm then they would be held accountable for not having done that. So if the city survived and everybody's okay, the watchman who was supposed to have sounded the alarm would be taken out and executed. 
He didn't do his job. That's, that's really a, an interesting salary continuation program. Uh, you know, do your job and you can live. Don't do your job. Yeah, you're out of here. Uh, the job title sounds fancy, but you could be personally liable for the results. So Ezekiel is a watchman for God, and he's sounding the warning. He's letting everybody know, hey, I'm a watchman. Here's this picture. It's a military picture he's drawing. So he's given an agricultural picture, a business picture, and now he's giving you a civil or military type of picture. Now, remember, there currently in Israel, there is no army. They've, they're gone. They were taken captive. They're with Ezekiel. All the mighty men are there. And they don't have any weapons and they can't fight right now. Uh, All the mighty men of valor valor were taken captive. And there is no army in Jerusalem. In 2 Kings 24 verse 14 we see that. Nebuchadnezzar led away into exile all Jerusalem. And all the captains and all the mighty men of valor. 10,000 captives. And all the craftsmen and the smiths. So he took uh, anyone who, could, who knew anything about war, uh, any of the officers he took, any of the NCOs he took, they're gone. Uh, anybody who could make weapons, he took them. He took everyone who had anything to do with maintaining military power. They're all gone. They're now in Babylon. None remained except the poorest people of the land. So he led Jehoiachin away into exile to Babylon. Also the king's mother and the king's wives and his officials, and the leading men of the land he led away into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. All the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the smiths, 1,000, all strong and fit for war, and these the king of Babylon brought into exile to Babylon. So we have no army, we have no uh, industrial complex left to be able to support an army or even build the weapons, they're all in Babylon, Uh, We have a light police force that's been left. They have no guidance whatsoever. And if anybody goes outside the wall, he's saying, uh, because nobody's there to be able to sound the alarm, they're going to get killed. The job of a watchman in Jerusalem, is what he's saying here, is a job of utter futility. You can sound the alarm, but there's nobody to go out and answer it. There's no army. There's no weapons. There's no force. There's no anything. So he's saying basically you have no army, you're going to have no food, you're going to have no water. A great picture for the folks who are back home in Jerusalem. Uh, But this is what's going to happen in a couple of years. Then he gets to the fourth picture, and he starts in verse 16. Even when their survivors escape, they will be on the mountains like doves of the valley, all of them mourning, each over his own iniquity. All hands will hang limp, and all knees will become like water. They'll gird themselves with sackcloth, and shuddering will overwhelm them, and shame will be on all faces and baldness on all their heads. The fourth picture is going to uh, the wild, and he's talking about mourning doves. And he's, he's actually pointing to them. He's giving an example from nature. This group, the one that, that he's talking about in this fourth picture, is the one that the remnant that's going to repopulate the land later, actually comes from. These are important people to God, and they recognize their sin. Notice they're mourning over their sin. They realize that they are the reason why all of this is happening. Instead of rejoicing at their escape, the people mourn over their sin. They wear sackcloth, they shave their heads in sorrow and repentance. They're fulfilling Ezekiel's prophecy of, of Ezekiel 6, verses 9 and 10. You've been listening to a message from Ezekiel on the Unsafe Bible. Pastor Ken has been diving deep into this major prophet to help us all understand how to apply these messages to our lives today. Have you ever found yourself falling into the trap of sin, suffering the consequences, and then only after you realize it's too late, you offer up a prayer and ask God, why me? It's a classic case of you made your bed and now you have to sleep in it but you still ask the question as if to suggest you may not be guilty. Well, as we see here in Ezekiel, that has been one of man's greatest weaknesses throughout history. If you want to hear more, don't hesitate to contact us. You can get in touch with us by going to theunsafebible.com. 
Once there, use the Connect tab and click on Connect Card. Just fill out the form and we'll reach out to you. To listen to this message or any others from Pastor Ken, just look under the Media tab at the unsafebible.com. If you found this ministry to be a blessing to you as you've been listening, you can show us your support for the Unsafe Bible Ministry by checking out the Give tab. No gift is too big or too small and will help us continue to reach the lost with God's Word. Any other questions? Feel free to explore the unsafebible.com for more information about when and where we meet. Directions can be found on the Contact tab. We're based out of Jupiter, Florida, and want to invite you to join us in person for our next service. Until then, we want to thank you for joining us right here on the Unsafe Bible.